And, uh, and I'll just say to the group here, uh, we're delighted to have Dr. Goldman speak to us. Uh, he's board certified in infectious disease and internal medicine and infectious disease and specializes in infectious disease work at Swedish, uh, trained at uh, University of Washington and chief time of chief, chief uh, resident at uh, Harborview Research with Fred Hutch. And um, one of our regional experts on uh, work with SARS-CoV-2 from beginning to end. And today's topic is long COVID, which we really appreciate having. So thank you, Dr. Goldman. Fire away. All right, great. Thanks for that nice introduction. Let me uh, share my screen here. Okay, can you see my slides? Real good. Yeah, thank yes. you. All right. Great. Um, all right. Um, <clears throat> so I've um, titled this talk today, Grappling uh, Update on Long COVID and Grappling with Uncertainty. And I think one thing that has impressed me about this condition is that we really still don't know a lot about it, and we're learning a lot more about it uh, week by week, but um, still no approved treatments and uh, a lot of I think pain and suffering from the community that's affected by this condition. So let's dive into it. Um, here are my uh, disclosures. I also want to acknowledge Jim Heath, who's my partner at Institute for Systems Biology, and Chris Vanderwalker from the VA Puget Sound. Um, I've borrowed some slides from both of them. All right, so here's the outline for the talk today. Um, let's see. that. There we go. Um, <clears throat> we'll do the first part talking about the clinical syndrome of long COVID or post-acute sequela after COVID or post-COVID conditions. That's the sort of the variable names we have for this new entity. And we'll talk about the epidemiology of it. In the second part, we'll talk about some emerging um, hypotheses about the pathophysiology, which are still somewhat undetermined at this point. And the last thing is we'll talk a little bit about kind of what's next and also the clinical clinical encounter um, with patients who have long COVID. All right, so I thought we'd start with a clinical case. I think this will seem very familiar to many of you who've been caring for um, hospitalized patients with COVID. There's a 53-year-old man who was previously healthy. He presents 10 days after the onset of a dry cough and fever. He's now having dyspnea with a, a peripheral blood oxygenation of 91%. CAT scan is shown, there's ground glass opacities where there's indicated by the arrow, and a PCR of the nasopharynx is positive for SARS-CoV-2. Hypoxia then progressed and he was treated with dexamethasone, uh, but antivirals were withheld after because he presented after the uh, early period. So COVID-19, as, as we're all aware, has a very heterogeneous course. There can be asymptomatic infection to devastating critical illness. And most, uh, the, the vast majority of cases are self-limited with symptoms that, that, that resolve within two to four weeks. In this particular case, here is follow-up imaging. Three weeks later, this patient had a number of uh, complications, including uh, staph aureus pneumonia, and had rapid progression of ground glass opacities to pulmonary fibrosis. <laughs> Um, so these infiltrates were going to cause dyspnea and severe fatigue for this patient in the in the months following the illness. Um, and this uh, these images um, were actually from this um, case report in Lancet Respiratory Medicine early in the pandemic, um, showing pulmonary fibrosis that that progressed very rapidly. The the stem here is just a, a representative stem from you know uh, compiled from one of the many cases I've seen during the pandemic. All right, so what is long COVID or PASC? Um, there's been variable definitions, and I have to say we still don't have an agreed upon definition. Um, this is an interesting condition in that patients actually discovered it. There was this patient-led research collaborative um, that put out this report very early in the pandemic uh, in May of 2020 talking about recovery, and they polled um, some hundreds of people in their uh, social media group and summarize the report. Um, so that really kicked off the um, medical understanding that this was an entity, but it did take some time uh, for further recognition after this patient-led uh, report. Um, the NIH treatment gui guidelines barely mention it, 
um, but now there is a huge um, effort underway called Recover, which I'll talk about you know, later at the end of the talk. Um, and then the CDC and the WHO both have definitions for what they call a post-COVID conditions, um, and they're sort of broad definitions. Um, and we can just read off the CDC one. Um, the CDC considers post-COVID conditions to be present if recovery does not occur after the four-week acute phase, even though patient, many patients continue to recover between four and 12 weeks. Um, and it's, um, it's basically any condition that doesn't return the patient to baseline that happens after that four-week time point. And an interesting fact is that the CDC and the WHO actually don't agree on the definition. The WHO says uh, the, the the persistence or new symptoms have to occur after 12 weeks, so the CDC says after four weeks. <clears throat> so, so what are the symptoms of long COVID or PASC? Here are some of the uh, most common symptoms. Um, they can be really in any part of the body. Uh, they can be neurologic or pulmonary. They can be um, cardiovascular and, and general symptoms are some of the most common. Fatigue and myalgia, joint pains, um, brain fog is something that many, many patients will complain about, um, this feeling of confusion or inability to concentrate, and then a persistent loss of taste and smell is also quite common. And of course, the, um, cough, dyspnea, um, those do tend to persist, um, but really uh, can affect any organ system and the complaints can be of, of any sort of flavor uh, shown here. Um, on the right is um, uh, a tattoo from uh, one of my patients uh, who was enrolled in one of our uh, observational research studies um, at Swedish. Uh, and um, he actually had this uh, tattoo um, put on his arm after he started suffering from long COVID that sort of represented the demons that were sort of uh, affecting his sleep uh, and, his, and his sort of PTSD symptoms about his initial um, acute COVID and time on the ventilator. Um, he did have some very persistent symptoms, um, especially I remember him talking very vividly about what the um, the smells, uh, the, uh, the visceral kind of changes to his smell and how many things were rancid. Um, so this patient was actually um, featured in a New York Times article um, after um, you know we published a, um, a, a big deep biologic dive into long COVID, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, here's another um, figure just about some of the um, uh, frequency of some of these symptoms. As you can see, uh, fatigue is, is very, very common. Uh, up to 58% of people suffering from long COVID will have a, a fatigue complaint, um, but also the common ones are headache, um, cough, um, and, and, and some of the neurologic symptoms. Anosmia is the loss of smell or um, parasmia would be the change in the smell. All right, so here's one of the seminal papers on the consequences of COVID-19 that came out of China very early in the pandemic. And this one studied, you know, almost 2,000 people and showed that 76% had at least one symptom at six months. So this was um, kind of eye-grabbing to me when I saw it. Um, this is a, a paper that was uh, from one of our colleagues uh, here in the Pacific Northwest, Helen Chu at UW. And um, her observational cohort showed that um, it was much less uh, frequent. Um, the the uh, these orange or yellow colors here are the um, the frequency of the patients that um, you know had the post COVID uh, symptoms, and you can see om almost all of them are less than twenty percent for any individual symptom, um, but you know it, it, in total around thirty percent of the patients had at least one symptom at the time of. Uh, you know, I think it was 12 weeks in this study. So many of the symptoms will get better over the time, but some will persist. Here was an early meta-analysis, and it looked at all the different studies um, that were reporting the, um, the frequency of PASC. And they came from, you know, countries all over the world and different follow-up timelines on this x-axis and on the y-axis, the PASC frequency. So what you can sort of see from this is in these early days where uh, you know researchers were reporting on, on long COVID, there really wasn't any standardized case definitions and the frequency was really all over the map um, from anywhere from close to, you know, 90% uh, of, of persons 
uh, you know, around 60 days in this UK study to, um, you know, around 10 percent. So um, we'll, we get a little bit more clarity as as we kind of go forward in the pandemic. Um, it seems to be sort of leveling out at around 25 to 30 percent um, seem to have long COVID. And I'll talk more about that. It's changed some uh, uh, in the different variant eras. <clears throat> this was a nice study out of the UK. It was a survey of some 70,000 plus people. And um, the different bars here are um, one symptom, two, three, four, or five or more symptoms. Um, and you can see that there's still a lot of um, improvement. You know, less and less people will report one ongoing symptom, you know, up to 30 days, and then still some sort of slower improvement out to around 90 days. But after 90 days, the symptoms improvement seems to really slow down. Um, so this, you know, I thought was quite a good um, representation of how some people don't really seem to improve too much after a certain time point. And, and we are still seeing patients in the clinic who have had their symptoms since early 2020. Um, another thing that came out from this study uh, quite clearly, I think, is that there is a, um, a sex predilection. Uh, women seem to be more affected than men, and that's, that's still not clear why. And then also age. Um, age is a very strong marker, and the um, the prevalence goes up of long COVID as as uh, age goes up. All right, so <clears throat> sorry, this is a bit of a busy slide, but there's an important sort of group of papers that came out of the Veterans Hospital. Um, very very um, savvy uh, epidemiology on their um, kind of big cohort, um, and they looked at. Um, you know, EHR records of really millions of veterans and, you know, 70,000 in this first paper had had COVID and they did very careful comparisons to um, matched controls and, and different control groups. And they looked at lab abnormalities, medications and diagnoses and showed that there was really this uh, elevated risk for long COVID um, across almost all organ systems cardiovascular, coagulation, dermatologic, endocrine, gastroenterology, general, kidney, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down the line, and different conditions within those organ systems. And the three different colors here, I'm not sure if it shows that well. Oh, here it is. Um, a positive or outpatient, orange is hospitalized, and purple is ICU. So there's this graded response for every single condition with severity of illness. And almost all of the outpatients even have a higher incidence of each of these conditions than their matched controls in the general population. So this was, um, you know, a very carefully done um, observational cohort that they followed up with with many other papers that sort of honed in on each organ system for neurologic and cardiovascular and renal and GI and showed that really these um, relationships existed um, for the patients who had COVID had much higher risk of um, all of these conditions. Um, and then they also showed that there was excess death. So um, over eight excess deaths for 1,000 patients at six months for those who had COVID compared to those who did not. Um, and this has been replicated outside of the VA system as well. Hmm. All right, so we, we sort of see this emerging symptom recognition um, that I've kind of explained a lot. Um, you know, we get this acute infection where there's PCR positivity, um, which, you know, might might persist. Um, usually by um, two weeks, it's gone, but sometimes out to four weeks um, or longer, especially in immunocompromised persons. And um, the symptoms, they do seem to get better during that time, but they don't seem to go away. And sometimes new symptoms pop up in these post-acute timeframes. And and here are some of the various symptoms that we've been talking about. So what about objective findings or biomarkers? That has been more challenging. Um, so if, if any of you are taking care of the patients in the clinic, this can be frustrating because people have a lot of subjective complaints, but oftentimes nothing objective that we can kind of pin our finger down on and say, aha, this is the problem. This is why you're experiencing this condition. So this was a, um, a carefully done cohort from the NIH um, 
189 patients and then um, controls that were uh, serologically tested negative for anti SARS CoV 2 antibodies. And what they showed here was that, you know, in their words, abnormal findings on physical exam and diagnostic testing were uncommon. And they also did some immunologic studies as well, not, you know, kind of um, sort of low depth studies. Um, but what they found is that compared to patients who had COVID, you know, they often had inflammation, but there was no real difference in patients who had, um, you know, PASC and, and who did not have PASC. Um, so this study, I think to me was nice because it kind of points out how in the clinic, sometimes we can't really identify the real um, the changes and put any objective biomarkers on it. In our study in recovery, we are seeing quite a lot of increases in D-dimer uh, so would, and also CRP. So I would say some of these things you know, are, are sometimes elevated, but um, in this study in aggregate, there was no, no difference between the um, PASS group and the non-PASS group. All right, so here is a nice study that, that utilized um, wearable data or Fitbit data. And um, it sort of showed that the change, the physiologic changes can be sort of subtle or, or maybe hard to detect. So um, you can see in these patients who had any sort of uh, elevation in heart rate, um, it persisted, but it was only a couple beats per minute. So is this significant or not? You know, I mean, I think it would be hard to detect in the clinic unless someone had pre and post Fitbit data, which, you know, we don't usually use that in the clinic. Um, but, you know, the, the patients are complaining about palpitations and the energy loss of fatigue, post-exertional malaise, um, and there's clearly something going on here, but it's subtle. So that, I think, can be um, frustrating for, for clinicians taking care of the patients. Um, that have subjective complaints and a lack of objective findings or very subtle or hard to explain or maybe might not seem clinically relevant physical findings. So how do we explain this? We'll talk next about um, emerging hypotheses and pathophysiology, and maybe we can stop and take a break just briefly if there's any questions uh, at this point about the clinical <laughs> syndrome or epidemiology, I'm happy to answer. Any questions for Dr. Goldman? I have a okay. question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, so during this time, we also, I think, saw a, a really increased reliance on social media uh, and people connecting through that. And so there's, um, you know, a lot of, you know, people talking on TikTok and YouTube. And do we think that that, plays a role at all in reporting, um, you know, kind of this thing like, oh, you've got it. Well, then I've got it too. Like we see it in other areas, like right now with ADHD, that kind of this increased recognition might be over-recognizing uh, certain symptoms. Yeah. So that's, that's what I thought a lot at the beginning too, when we saw this, um, the patient collaborative, um, I was sort of wondering about that. You know, they're all on social media. They're all kind of talking to each other and collecting the data. So it's, it seems confounded. That's That was my first thought about it, too. But as more and more data emerged, it seemed that less and less likely that that was explaining this. And the reason is because of, you know, studies like this one where they sampled, um, you know, 70,000 people in the UK community. Um, you know, and this was a good percentage of them and um, including, um, you know, oops, including people who are older. Um, so to me, that seems unlikely to really explain it. And then, you know, we also see some of these objective findings, you know, like new incident diagnoses and lab abnormalities, um, which uh, don't really go along with um, you know, patients, you know, kind of, you know, amplifying on social media. Um, so I think, I think that's definitely a concern. Um, and it can be confounding when we're collecting patient reported outcomes, but there seems to be a strength of evidence that, um, that this does exist across different organ systems that couldn't be explained by the, um, 
you know, the kind of the amplification of social media alone. But that's a great, that's a really great question. And Dr. Goldman, there's a question in the chat. Any mm -hmm. difference in long haul symptoms in vaccinated versus unvaccinated patients? Great question. I'm going to, I'm going to get into that in, in that third part there. Um, but okay. the short answer is um, yes, there's less in vaccinated persons, but it doesn't protect entirely. And I'll show you that data. All right, so okay. let's get a little bit. Oh, sorry, is there was there another question? Oh, sorry, I had two questions. One, one is kind of the nature of the peripheral neuropathy, and and the second question would be: uh, Is most of this very consistent across the spectrum of uh, symptoms, or are you seeing a lot of off and on with weeks in between? Yeah, so the peripheral neuropathy was that can be. Um, lots of different things. Um, in my clinic, I've had some people describing sort of dysesthesias, like very hypersensitive skin, and some people describing numbness and tingling type symptoms. Um, so that can be a little variable. Um, and then in terms of consistency, there are some very, very consistent um, symptoms. One of the, the most common ones is this persistent loss of taste or smell or change in taste and smell. Um, brain fog, and this sort of feeling of confusion or inability to concentrate, very, very common. And so is fatigue and especially post-exertional malaise or post-exertional fatigue. So those seem to be some very consistent symptoms, but then a lot of the other ones are really, uh, you know, all over the, all over the place. So some people will be affected by certain things and some will not. Thank you. All right, so let's talk about the, um, the hypotheses and the pathophysiology. Um, so I'm going to talk for a couple minutes about a study that we did at Swedish with um, Institute for Systems Biology. This was sort of, um, you know, Jim Heath is the main collaborator over there, but there's just a huge um, cast of people at, um, at ISB and Swedish um, and, and other collaborating organizations that have um, been involved with this work. Um, we did a very in-depth study of, oh, and, and by the way, this is the um, cover of uh, the journal Cell, um, where we published a paper, um, uh, you know, a, a little over a year ago now, which was kind of the first deep dive into the biology of long COVID. And, and we uh, came up with predictors of things that um, predicted the, or anticipated the development of long COVID. Um, so here's the study schema. Um, we... Uh, enrolled over 200 people, and um, our colleague at UW, Helen Chu, had a, a sort of a totally independent cohort with over 100 people. Um, and we sampled people at roughly these time points, you know, when we first encountered them in the hospital or in the outpatient setting, you know, one to two weeks after that, and then at two to three months later. And we thought we were going to be showing um, the, you know, resolving or convalescence uh, time point turned out in the study that you know we we found something different we found that you know we could look at what was causing uh, long covid at that time um we did uh symptom screens at each of these three time points um and then we went back and did a, an additional collection um of of additional um uh patient reported uh, symptoms in a, an unstructured uh, interview um and we did all sorts of uh other um multi-omic assessments, so protein analysis, metabolomic analysis, antibodies, and lots of uh, different immunologic studies. Um, so we, you know, had all these different immunologic signatures and different risk factors and uh, post-acute sequelae uh, patient-reported outcomes, and we did this big correlation matrix to try to understand what was associated with what. Um, so here um, are some of the symptoms, you know, these will look familiar from the previous slides. What you know, what patients told us was very similar to what was being reported um, in the medical literature. Um, for instance, in in Helen Chu's study, and also in this my COVID diary studies, which was um, run out of Providence by Ari Robachek and Bill Wright. Um, I want to give a special shout out to uh, Heather Algren and Julie Wallach, who um, Julie was the lead coordinator on this, and Heather and I kind of did a lot of the. Um, uh, standardizing of the of the symptom surveys so that we could um, perform some of these analyses. 
Um, I'll, it's a, it's a huge paper with a with a lot of results, and I'm just going to pull out a couple that I think are are clinically relevant. Um, of all the uh, um, protein measurements, um, uh, these proteins that describe circadian rhythm were really the ones that um, were abnormal, and uh, they they associated with with the respiratory symptoms of PASC. Um, in uh, actually, cortisone and cortisol were uh, some other ones. They were uh, slightly depressed in patients who had respiratory viral PASC um, compared um, to those uh, who didn't. Um, and uh, we did some other analyses in this um, showing that that receipt of dexamethasone during acute COVID wasn't the cause of uh, this depressed uh, cortisol levels. Um, we also looked at um, SARS-CoV-2 vi viremia, so uh, RNA detected in the blood, EBV and CMV, and um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus detected in blood does strongly correlate with uh, survival. So that's a sort of severity marker of sorts, um, but it also was shown to correlate with some neurologic past symptoms. And EBV reactivation, although it was low level, also, uh, and seen in about 20%, also correlated with some of the neurologic past symptoms. <clears throat> this is a busy slide, and I'll just sort of um, walk you through it briefly, but an important result of the study. Um, we looked at anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies here. Um, you know, this is to the N or nucleocapsid protein or the S or spike. And we looked at some of the um, autoantibodies or, you know, anti-nuclear antibodies and um, tested patients at the three time points. And this matrix shows that patients who had um, positive autoantibodies in this sort of quadrant here, um, you know, it associated with having other autoantibodies, but it anti-correlated with having protective anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. So this is in our cohort here. And that same finding, more or less, you know, similar, was seen in this totally separate independent cohort. So, ha you know, having autoantibodies was, was, you know, those patients also didn't have the good or protective anti-SARS-CoV-2 antiviral antibodies. And those correlated with different... Um, you know, past symptoms. So this is a, a very important result from the study that um, has a lot of work has followed that has sort of replicated this finding. All right, so the summary points, um, EBV viremia and SARS-CoV-2 uh, viremia in blood both predicted, you know, different aspects of PASC, different PASC um, phenotypes. Um, type 2 diabetes also predicted um, the development of PASC. And, and these autoantibodies, um, mostly anti-nuclear antibodies, um, had a very strong association. So the presence of the antibodies um, at the start um, predicted the later development of PASC. The, the antibodies we, we showed were not really uh, developing in response to SARS-CoV-2. They were present uh, often at subclinical levels um, at the time of diagnosis. <clears throat> All right. Um, so. Here are some of the emerging um, uh, mechanisms that have been described, um, you know, part, partly, in, you know, after our, our, our paper, but also, you know, many, many other studies now have been looking at what's causing PASS. And there's these basic, you know, different categories. Um, persistence of virus and immune dysregulation, and, and the virus might be sort of cordoned off in, you know, immunologic protected sites in the body. Microbial dysbiosis, uh, or you know, of the you know the virome or the microbiome, um, autoimmunity, um, blood clotting and endothelial abnormalities. Um, that was something we didn't really focus in too much, but there's been a lot of research there showing problems. And then dysfunctional neurologic signaling or neurologic damage. Yeah, really. Don't bring up. All right, so I'll just give you um, some of the you know, high level data for these different um, ideas. Um, here's, uh, you know, a um, case report from the transplant literature about pulmonary fibrosis in a patient who, um, you know, did not recover from uh, from COVID. So direct tissue injury is really the idea here. During acute COVID, um, direct tissue injury can occur. And, and we saw the case I showed you at the beginning with the stem of the patient with lung, fi lung fibrosis. 
there have been quite a number of patients now who have required a lung transplant because of the severity of the of the pulmonary fibrosis. This patient in this study was 44. Um, but there's sub subtilar findings as well. There's you know traction bronchiectasis and subpleural honeycombing um, that can be seen in patients who aren't as severely affected. You know this uh, patient required ECMO and a ventilator all the way up to the point of, of, of transplant. But but the the normal course is probably much more subtle. <clears throat> all right, SARS-CoV-2 viral persistence. Um, this is a really very nicely done autopsy study that was um, published in um, Nature at the end of last year. And um, <clears throat> this showed that um, you know, RNA can be detected in the tissues for up to 230 days. And this subgenomic RNA, which is basically a marker for um, ongoing virus replication, was detected in, you know, in this one patient up to 76 days. Um, so this is, I think, really quite a fascinating study. They detected virus across all different body compartments, but the um, the GI tract and the brain seem to be some of the protected spaces where um, where the virus might persist. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, this is an autopsy study, so it's very hard to detect the virus by conventional assays. The viremia tends to go away after a couple weeks at the latest but there might be these sort of small reservoirs in the body. So this, this study did a very careful look, you know, across all different body compartments and found evidence for virus and active virus replication in all different tissues. And they had lots of different complementary methods to show this. We, we lost your slides. Oh, did you? Okay, sorry. Let me try to share again. Thanks for letting me know. Can you see that? Yes. Yep. There we go. Thanks. Okay. Great. Um, let me just. <clears throat> okay. So we talked about, um, you know, the finding of autoimmunity, and we looked in our study at just a handful of autoimmune markers for anti-nuclear antibodies. But what we see is there are autoantibodies across all different markers to immunologic cells. So all of these bars here on the left in this figure are um, all different cell types, uh, NK cells, myeloid cells, B cells, T cells, et cetera. And we see um, autoantibodies against different markers uh, in, in all these cell lines in patients with acute COVID. So this is still kind of un, you know, poorly understood or we don't know what of these many potential different biomarkers could be significant. But there's clearly these signals of, you know, anti-immune cell autoantibodies. Um, microvascular clotting or endothelial dysfunction. This is a group um, that has done a lot showing uh, that the, there are clots in the microcirculation. And, and some of these are amyloid uh, fibrin clots. Um, so that could explain a lot of the um, sort of ongoing tissue injury signals that, that we see. Um, dysfunctional neurologic signaling, and this might have to do with ongoing, um, you know, Im immune activation or or uh, or neurologic um, tissue damage. Um, this uh, study um, out of cell kind of showed that there are these many um, elevated uh, inflammation markers, um, and uh, this study um, showed uh, these sort of, uh, you know. Nerve, uh, nerve marker damage uh, proteins that, that were circulating. Um, so that is one explanatory model for the um, brain fog that is, is a very common complaint amongst patients suffering long COVID. All right, um, so <clears throat> the next part, um, I want to just kind of summarize with sort of updates of where we are and what, what we can do. Um, when we encounter patients who have complaints about long COVID. And um, I'll just sort of preface by saying there's still a lot of uncertainty about this and um, no uh, defined treatments. So these um, encounters can be um, sort of you know, frustrating for, I think, for patients and providers alike. Um, so I think one, you know, <clears throat> hopeful uh, signal in all this is that 
Um, long COVID may be decreasing in the Omicron area, especially in those vaccinated. And we had a question about that, and I'll, I'll go into some of that data. But in this study from Clinical Infectious Disease, um, they showed that some of the symptoms in Omicron cases had really the same frequency in negative controls. So, you know, the ne negative controls are actually hard to find in the Omicron area because so many of us have, have become affected by it. So I think we take this data with a little bit of a grain of salt, but there's still, you know, the symptoms are still there, but hard to distinguish from the quote unquote negative controls. And, and you know, this other study that I'm referencing down here showed that once they adjusted for vaccination, that effect of being, um, you know, no different was almost entirely related to vaccination. Um, here are data from a meta-analysis that was published recently in JAMA Internal Medicine um, that shows that vaccination does in fact have protective effect for long COVID, but it's unfortunately um, <clears throat> not fully protective. So, um, you know, you can see the, the odds ratios here for protection, you know, anywhere from, you know, around a 60% uh, effect or, or uh, just over 20% effect um, at protection. And the sort of the overall um, looks like it's about, you know, 60, uh, uh, 30, 40% protection. So I think that this is a really important tool, obviously, not just for the prevention of severe COVID, or prevention of COVID, but also potentially prevents, um, you know, the development of long COVID. Could this I ask, was another... that... Yep, sorry, uh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, could I ask, does that include the uh, bivalent phase of uh, vaccination protection? Um, so I did not dive into each one of these studies, but I believe most of them are from, um, that include, um, you know, the vaccine, the, the, the variant errors before uh, Omicron. So it probably would not have included the bivalent vaccine. But <clears throat> I think we have no reason to doubt that the bivalent would, um, you know, not have a similar effect. I think it, it's, you know, it's, it's more well matched to the current viruses than the, than the old one. And uh, I would assume that the protection would be of a similar magnitude, but if the um, maybe a, a, a smaller absolute risk reduction because of the smaller, um, you know, incidence of PASC and Omicron, but the, a similar, um, you know, uh, effect size is what, what I would guess, but I don't think we really have those data. They're still emerging probably. Um, <clears throat> also to point out the same VA group that, that did the, you know, huge high dimensional work on their cohort, they showed that um, prior SARS-CoV-2, um, you know, you can when you have a breakthrough infection, you still get long COVID, but it's less bad than after your first infection. Um, but still worse than not, you know, than not getting it. So unfortunately, breakthrough infection like vaccination is or, or sorry, prior COVID like vaccination is partly protective, but not fully protective. <clears throat> okay, so this is a, um, a really nice study also by that same VA group where they looked at the receipt of um, near mal uh, uh, or I can never pronounce this one, uh, near matrelivir, which is the um, you know, active agent in um, the drug Paxlovid. Um, and they looked at high-risk people who received it versus those who didn't. And they showed that this um, uh, medicine, when given at the time of acute COVID, was associated with less development of PASC um, in, in, the, in the following months. Um, and they also did a nice um, substratification for, you know, it was sort of a consistent effect among people with few risk factors to many risk factors, um, vaccinated, unvaccinated, boosted, and um, and then also whether they've had prior uh, prior infection or not. <clears throat> okay, so so what do we do in the clinic or or the hospital when we're encountering patients with with past symptoms? And I think we've you know described some um, different 
subphenotypes and different mechanisms of action. Um, there's these direct tissue uh, damage or injury, um, you know, th uh, associations and some post critical illness associations, and then just you know more or less some unexplained um, symptoms or, or subphenotypes. And um, there are no proven therapies for long COVID at this time. So, what to offer patients? I think is a a big challenge and a big source of dissatisfaction, as I've mentioned, for both patients and providers. And, you know, here are some of the um, ideas that have been floated um, on what to do. I am not necessarily promoting any of them because, as I said, there are no proven therapies. But the approach I tend to take in clinic is that if we can identify a symptom cluster to work on the syndromic management or symptom management of that cluster. Um, so, you know, that that might be, um, you know, having helping someone develop a regimen for their exercise or exertion pacing and, and not overdo it. Um, or if they do have demonstrable um, tachycardia to, you know, to offer beta blockers, um, et cetera. So these are the types of things that that, that we can do um, to 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 help our patients. Um, and here's a nice review that that sort of discusses some of these. Um, you know, what kinds of tests that we can send up to kind of try to hone in on some of the findings. So if someone has pulmonary or cardiovascular complaints, you know, consider these tests to further characterize or phenotype the patient. Um, you know, doing some hematologic studies, you know, early referral to nephrology. Um, thinking about rehabilitation, um, and then obviously um, addressing some of the neuropsychiatric uh, problems and, and sleep is actually a big one that that I found that some patients can benefit a lot from by um, helping them to uh, to manage sleep. All right, so next steps, there's been this big ongoing effort um, from the NIH. I, I mentioned it briefly, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it now. Um, we're a part of this uh, at Swedish, and um, it's, our, our hub is sort of being led by colleagues at, at, at ISB. This is a big observational study, and we've enrolled over 200 patients to kind of better detail some of the pathophysiology. We're starting to see results coming out from that. Um, uh, I I'm expecting a couple of reports from this study in the in the coming months. Um, there's also a you know a big um, clinical trial um, center, and it's it, it it hasn't launched yet. There's not a um, active intervention, but we're, we are getting quite close there. Um, so this is a, is a very big project, over a billion dollar investment by the federal government um, into this um, you know observational study to understand the pathophysiology and into a clinical trials core with an adaptive trials platform that's going to test multiple um, you know, potential therapies in different domains. Um, <clears throat> so the first the first study uh, that is being rolled out is, is a study of Paxlovid. So it's going to be given for different durations um, at the time of PASC or, or long COVID. So the, the study I showed you before that um, Paxlovid can potentially prevent long COVID. That's when you give Paxlovid at the time of acute infection. Um, you know, it will uh, be associated with a reduced incidence of PASC later. This study is going to actually look at um, using Paxlovid when someone has long COVID and seeing if that um, can reduce symptoms. And the you know presumptive mechanism there would be to disrupt that viral reservoir that that I showed you in some of those slides. <clears throat> All right, so there's lots of different trials going on outside of this recover study, and here are some of the um, different um, domains that are being tested. Um, <clears throat> and, and this this actually um, paper came out, uh, or this this news report came out yesterday um, at Stat News. Um, that, that's sort of very critical of this um, recover initiative. Um, sort of asking where where are the you know, the promised treatments? Um, you know, you can sort of see that NIH kind of wanted to launch these trials by sort of uh, Q3, 4 last year, but we're still not launched in Q2 of 2023. 
Um, so, you know, I, I, I do have a lot of hope in this um, initiative to kind of get the ball rolling with testing some treatments. Um, and, um, you know, but, but there has been some delays and, and sort of more frustration for this community. All right, so I'll sort of, you know, close with this one last idea about gaslighting. So this was actually this term gaslighting is um, was the, the Miriam Webster word of the year. Um, and, and what it what it is, is it's um, the act or practice of grossly misleading someone, especially for one's own advantage. So so I don't think anyone in healthcare science is intentionally misleading um, patients with past, but that is how it feels to a lot of of, of my patients. Um, they feel sort of gaslit by the healthcare system. And these are um, some of the, you know, many comments that, um, you know, people have told me in clinic, um, you know, especially early in the pandemic, they said, you know, they said I wasn't sick enough to get a test. And um, this is actually a very common complaint. I have dozens of patients who have told me this um, and no one has listened to me and, and my doctors don't know what to do. And this one, I especially empathize with because I also don't know what to do uh, as I don't know exactly how to help the, the individual in front of me, you know, oftentimes. Um, and, you know, I'm debilitated and I wasn't like this before. So these are some of the things people are feeling. And, um, you know, this is sort of how I kind of put it all together at the end of the day. That the past or long COVID is new. It's a new condition. Um, you know, we know that it's bad. I've showed you a lot of the data that that sort of has convinced me that this is a real entity and it's it's significant and um, we struggle on how to define it. We cannot explain it. We can't fix it. And many of our patients are concerned or impacted. So the approach I try to take in clinic is to you know first just acknowledge the patient and their experience. I think their experience is real. And then you know think about syndromic management. Um, so focusing on uh, alleviation of symptoms, I think is the 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 current best practice approach and and also in the setting of of do no harm. So I, I personally don't prescribe some of the um, you know treatments that 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 are going around on social media or are being used in long COVID clinics um, like low dose naltrexone is a very common one. I, I don't know if that works and I tend to take a, a, a do no harm approach, but I do um, offer syndromic management for things that are, are objective or um, have, you know, well described um, syndromic management, uh, you know, in, in other conditions. Um, try to managing uh, the expectations of patients. So, so negative tests are not disbelief on my part. Um, and, and I unfortunately spend a considerable amount of time kind of going over that and, and sort of revalidating patients um, on their symptoms. And I think, you know, bearing witness is is an important part of this too. Um, you know, being there with your patients and um, hearing them, I think, is pretty therapeutic in itself. And then, you know, we don't have really tried and true treatments, but I think we do have some <clears throat> ideas on prevention and vaccination and antivirals at the acute acute COVID time point do seem to reduce PASC. So I think you know, it's it behooves us to kind of um, you know, increase those uh, the use of the antivirals more for patients who who qualify uh, the high risk ones. Can I ask you a question about that? Yes, please. Um, so with the antivirals probably helping reduce the risk of long COVID, has there been um, discussion of expanding antiviral use to those who are not high risk who still might end up with long COVID? Um, and what is, do we know what that looks like um, in those people who don't have traditional risk factors, whether there may be benefit even for healthy people so that they don't get long COVID? Yeah, I mean, that is a, that is a fabulous question. And um, so we're, we are going to be actively studying that soon. There's a good study for a new um, oral antiviral that is, um, metabolites to the same active metabolite as um, remdesivir is metabolized to, and that's going to be studied in standard risk persons, so sort of low risk persons. And there is a, um, you know, long COVID um, outcome on that study. 
Um, I think it's a little too early now <clears throat> to recommend it for. Uh, so first of all, you know, Paxlovid is not FDA approved fully, right? It's still in this emergency use authorization. Mm -hmm. So, so we definitely cannot recommend it, you know, outside of the, um, you know, very strict criteria that the FDA puts on us that that puts our, you know, medical license in jeopardy. I think once it gets authorized, you know, all of us as healthcare providers have the choice of whether we want to use it off label. I personally wouldn't do that for for standard risk people because we really don't have any data to support that. And the data that supports the Paxlovid benefit is in high risk persons. Um, so, you know, I don't think personally I would make that decision, but, um, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure potentially on us as providers to do that. So that's a good thing to sort of think through, you know, how you would um, um, respond to that. Um, and, um, that's going to be a challenge for us, but, but I do think that, you know, data will be coming to know if standard risk people would benefit at all from an antiviral upfront. Great question. Um, there's a question in the chat outside of pregnancy. Is there any role for thromboprophylaxis in patients with mild COVID infection? diagnosed multiple DVTs in the outpatient setting, some soon after infection, and some a few months after, otherwise unprovoked. Yeah, so um, let me just reread that question. It's a little, a lot there. Um, so there's a complicated um, story with, with uh, anticoagulation at the time of acute COVID. And there's um, some reports about this, I think a little over a year ago or so from some of the big platform trials. And, and it was confusing about what to do with anticoagulation. Um, I believe that the, the finding is that in um, standard risk people, higher dose anticoagulation was helpful, but in the critically ill population, it was not helpful. So, you know, you, you do do standard, you know, um, uh, you know, thromboprophylaxis and critical ill and 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 treatment dose in the um, in the uh, non critical Ill hospitalized population. Um, but 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 we really haven't adopted that at Swedish. I think we still basically do standard, you know, um, uh, you know, prevention dose anticoagulation. Now, if someone has diagnosed DVTs, um, <clears throat> then yes, I think they should be treated for their DBT. You know, once we diagnose the entity, we have to treat it. That's the sort of the idea of, um, you know, this trying to, you know, subphenotype or characterize um, the underlying cause of the symptoms. And when we find something, we should treat it. Um, so, uh, so yes, in terms of whether we should give thromboprophylaxis, that's a very good question that I don't know the answer to. I don't think we have data about whether that would be helpful or harmful. So that, you know, that should be studied. Um, and, um, you know, we just don't have that data yet. So I think if in the absence of the data, I would personally take a do not harm approach and, you know, not risk the, the bleeding complications with an unproven therapy. Now, if you have someone who has been on long-term anticoagulation for multiple DBTs in the past and they get COVID, that's an individual risk assessment you have to take with that in, you know, individual patient. And I think you could go either way on that for sure. How are the insurance companies treating this? Do you, do you, is your diagnosis long COVID or is it more syndromic uh, based to represent the work you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I haven't I haven't really run into many problems at all with insurance. I think I've only had one letter that denied some of the tests I sent. Um, mostly insurance companies seem to be kind of staying away from this, it seems like. Um, I, I put long COVID diagnosis on there when I feel that that diagnosis is justified and some people who I 
who have no objective evidence for a history of um, of COVID, like if they didn't get tested or if they got tested, but you know, outside the acute window when I wouldn't expect their PCR to be positive, for instance, um, or some people only got their first antibody test, you know, a year or more after their COVID episode. Um, these are challenging, and I'm I'm using different um, different uh, diagnoses there. I I put on post viral condition sometimes when it's when it's not clearly uh, long COVID, and I put on um, you know uh, MECFS, which is uh, you know uh, you know that's I think a, a kind of a general catch all term for the you know some of the conditions that we can't sort of pinpoint exactly to to uh, to COVID. Thank you. And then yeah, I I put on the diagnosis codes for the for the um, specific symptoms too, especially if, if interventions are being given. Dr. Goldman, did you see that new question that just popped in the chat? Um, which one? I see a couple there. Let's see the studies comparing use of dexamethasone versus methylprednisolone for developing PASC. <clears throat> Um, are there some? Yeah, and and um, Larry, is that the? Uh, are you talking about when those steroids are used at the time of acute COVID? Like yeah, um, I haven't seen that yet, but but actually, um, I, I am looking at that with one of the collaborators on Recover. Um, in a sort of nationalized, um, uh, you know, claims database. So um, stay tuned. <laughs> There's actually going to be some info coming about that soon. Um, but the the short story is, and I, I actually haven't seen the specific, um, you know, individual steroid uh, estimates about effect on PASC, but the way I've been thinking about it is they're kind of the same, but, but we, I, you know, we should have some more information from that um, relatively soon. All right, and there was a question about, um, uh, uh, I'll just read it. It's concerning that we, the medical community, have not been doing a great job of recognizing new disease complications. If patients are figuring it out on their own, i.e. Lyme disease um, by moms and long COVID by a social media group, we are not taking advantage of our EHR slash AI to recognize patterns of disease. Um, so I think, you know, this is a good point. I mean, I, I think some of these post-infection syndromes, and, and Lyme is a great example, have introduced a lot of controversy. And I think that having this, you know, pandemic event where we had a sort of a mass infection of the general population over a short, you know, couple year time period, really does kind of focus the attention on this and make it a lot easier to study than something that's vague and um, you know subtle that happens you know intermittently over many decades. Um, so I, you know I do hope that you know what we are learning about long COVID because it's a little bit easier to study um, you know given um, the sort of the the time course of it all happening all at once to the general population, um, we'll be able to take some of these findings and apply them to some of the other unexplained medical phenomenon that 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 you know that patients and providers struggle with um, to know what to do. Um, so that's that's a great point. Good. Well, any other questions or anything else in the chat? I'm not seeing the chat here. I think we're all caught up on the chat. Okay. Well, we want to, uh, before, I guess before we go, I want to mention that uh, our next CME will be May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. We'll have uh, the two, two residents, Dr. Nicole Jeffrey and Dr. Carolyn uh, Jolly, presenting on uh, phenobol, phenobarbital for managing severe alcohol withdrawal as we look at the potential for a, a new protocol uh, an additional protocol here for Olympic Medical Center. So uh, please join us May 5th. And doc, Dr. Goldman, thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation and for answering all of our questions.
Uh, this is going to be a inter very interesting uh, uh, diagnosis to follow as uh, we evolve in the, the learning about it. So thank you. Yep. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your work on it. Thanks for uh, having me to talk and uh, thanks for all the great questions and engagement. Real good. We'd love to get you back. So have, have a good weekend and uh, thank you again.